Hello, today we are interviewing Professor Dipankar Dansarma, Indian scientist and structural chemist. Hello and thanks for being with us today. You came today at Ecole Polytechnique to give a conference, which is part of CEFIPRA cycle of conferences. CEFIPRA is an Indo-French center for the promotion of advanced research. You're actually a member of a governing body. Uh, what could you say about Indo-French collaborations today, and in particular about your collaboration with Ecole Polytechnique? Well, um, there are several questions built into that, so exactly. I'll take one at a time. Um, the point is that CEFIPRA, which has been established about approximately 30 years ago, was felt at that time by the two prime ministers at that time, an important instrument to initiate collaboration between the two countries. And it was established with equal partnership and contribution uh, from the two countries. And it's been one of the most effective instrument to have promoted collaboration between the two countries, scientific collaboration and scientific input to industrial collaboration. There's another component to that. They have many, many different segments under which they promote this collaboration. But their primary activity is in bringing different groups of scientists from the two countries to work together on a common theme. And it's been very effective in the sense of having mobility, Indian scientists come here, Indian students come here as postdoctoral or even PhD students, and the reverse flow also, and they've tackled many very important uh, scientific problems over the years. And they have been very effective, their publication profile has been extremely good, and they've also contributed to several industrial applications as far as I remember. So I've been associated with CEFIC for, for a very long time. And you also mentioned about this lecture series. It's, it's actually a new thing, relatively new thing, was introduced about four years ago. And uh, I was a member of the Scientific Council of CEFIPRA at the time when this was conceived. This was on the occasion of the 25 years completion of CEFIPRA. And in, under which uh, alternate year, one year a French scientist goes to India, gives a lecture tour. And uh, next year an Indian scientist come to France to give lecture to. This is the fourth in that series, so I'm the second Indian scientist coming. There have been two French scientists that have gone before me to India. So this uh, really promotes the understanding of the kind of activity that's going on in the two countries very well. So I think it's really exciting. And coming to the collaboration between my group and Ecole Polytechnique, I'm uh, interacting very strongly with the group of Professor Zilke Biaman who is a very well-known theoretical condensed matter physicist. <clears throat> and I've known Silke for many years now because she's a very prominent player in this activity uh, that my group is involved in. Uh, we are trying to understand uh, what I somewhat jokingly keep telling Zilke is the last outstanding problem of condensed matter physics. It's a slight exaggeration, but it's a, it's a very interesting problem. There's something called VO2, vanadium dioxide, which is incidentally also a very important material from technological point of view. It's a thermochromic material, so it's an energy saving material when applied to the windows, etc. It has a very interesting metal to insulator transition. These are those very special materials which uh, at some temperature behave like copper. They conduct electricity and has all metallic properties. And you change the temperature slightly and it becomes highly insulating. And what makes this fantastic transition, something that looks like copper becoming like wood, to borrow a phrase from another very senior scientist of many years ago, is something that has fascinated uh, the condensed matter scientists and people like Zilke, myself, and others. There's a particular polymorph, a particular crystallographic phase of VO2, which shows a very unusual, this metal to insulator transition. And you were we're working very hard to understand that. We did some experiment in collaboration with a group in Singapore. It's, so it's a really multinational. That's why science is borderless in many, many senses, and I'll come back to that later. So it's samples that were generated in Singapore, and we did some spectroscopic study of it, and Zilke is now trying to understand it from a, a theoretical uh, point of view. 
and we have been discussing yesterday, we had a very intense discussion involving her group members and ours. We believe we are close to understanding it. It's fascinating, it's challenging, it's exciting, and at times frustrating. <laughs> so it's been a wonderful journey together. You know, the motto of a corporal technique that was given by Napoleon more than 200 years ago is for nation, sciences and glory. And actually the pl plurality of the word sciences is very important because the academic programs of a corporal technique are very multidisciplinary. Right. And uh, a third of, of engineer polytechnician mm -hmm. students opt for research mm -hmm. once graduated. So I have a quote of you. Uh, how science is borderless. What could you say about interdisciplinarity in science or sciences? And is interdisciplinarity important for the international research issues of today? It just couldn't be overemphasized how important multidisciplinarity is. You know, I was very, very happy to know that in ECOL, it's part of the system that you built in that it's multidisciplinary. I was told in the undergraduate program, they're not allowed to specialize in the first couple of years. Exactly. I was very fortunate myself to have been educated. My undergraduate program was called an integrated master's program, which is very different from at that time what Indian system was. Indian system was you did a three years of bachelor's degree, two years of master's degree after your schooling. And at the bachelor's level, you decided whether you were studying physics or chemistry or mathematics or biology. You did have the other subjects a little bit, but nobody took them seriously. But ours was an integrated program where we had to learn every engineering subject, every humanities subject, every physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology, everything had to be learned. And it's a five-year program, the first two and a half years. We had to learn all this, and only in the last two and a half years, we specialized into our areas, which was physics for me at that time. Now that, I think, has played a tremendous role in shaping myself as a scientist and as a world citizen, because it has given me a perspective and understanding which is much broader than most of the others uh, of my generation. Because today, if you want to do science, you cannot do science by compartmentalizing yourself into being a physicist or a theoretical scientist, an experimental scientist on one hand, physics, chemistry, biology, engineering on the other. The best research is done all over the world by combining expertise from everything. I do understand that it's not possible for you to be expert in everything. You shouldn't even try to. So you need to collaborate. This brings in the other aspect of the borderless. Borderless not in discipline, borderless not in terms of people that get involved in trying to solve a problem together. And in order to bring in the right people with the right expertise, you need to have an appreciation for the other field. And this is what you get when you have a multidisciplinary approach to the education that you get. The best research all over the world today is multidisciplinary. You'll find many authors are together trying to solve an important problem. But you can only do that when you have the preparedness of mind. And that preparedness of mind comes only when you have been exposed as a part of the education and multidisciplinary approach. So I think it's extraordinarily important. I feel very bad whenever I see people are getting very highly specialized. I scold my PhD students when they don't go to a seminar because they think it's not in their area. I said that you're becoming a technician. You're not becoming a scientist. And this is something that really cannot be overemphasized. It's just extremely important. You know, at Ecole Polytechnique, we strongly support and believe in entrepreneurship and innovation. We actually have a center entirely dedicated to entrepreneurship and innovation that hosts quite an, quite, quite an impressive number of startups specialized in technology, in nanoscience, in connected, in connected objects. You are known for your researches in the field of solid-state chemistry, spectroscopy, concerted matter physics, material science and nanoscience. What could you say about innovative materials of today and the importance of materials science? I, of course, have a very biased view in the <laughs> because I'm a material scientist. I do materials chemistry, materials physics and materials engineering at times. <clears throat> I have always felt that, I always say that the next three decades are going to belong to materials. 
all innovations will come to me from materials. But then when I look back, actually I think that I'm underselling my field. If you think of human civilization and the growth of human civilization, which are the ages that you know? Stone age, iron age, copper age. These are all materials, stone, iron, copper. The modern time we call it silicon age, right? So it's always, you'll see that we have designated entire era of human development to materials. Materials drive our all, all kind of innovations. And these exciting properties of materials that you discover and then innovative applications of them is what material science is all about. And that's why I think materials are going to stay, materials are going to excite, materials are going to keep us going, forging ahead. Uh, you mentioned another thing which is, I think is very important is the entrepreneurship. Uh, again, I belong to a generation of scientists in India who are not very closely connected, not in general, some of them were, but not very closely connected. We believed science was, you did science, it was somebody else's trouble to translate science into an applicable science. <clears throat> But today, again, uh, it's understood more and more that uh, the importance of keeping in mind how your science impacts the society. Because you're not doing science in isolation. You're a part of the society. You respond to social changes, and what you do must make the society respond. And this connection, those who understand, actually do more exciting and more relevant science. Sometimes people believe that relevant science is not exciting. They have a complete deep misunderstanding of the process. So I think it's very important. I have tried to reshape and redirect myself to some extent. Now I think more in terms of patenting, more in terms of what the eventual application may be in many of the activity that I do. Once again, like I said, you need many expertise to do science and that's where collaboration comes in. It's also very difficult for one individual to be a good scientist and also be a good person to develop prototype, then to scale up, then to market, to, then to commercialization. It's a very long chain and requires very different kind of expertise. So one individual may not be able to do everything, but you must have an appreciation for the process so that you can find out the route and eventually the society must gain. That's also a deep commitment to the society that you must have. You're not in isolation. You're doing it in a context, and that context must remain in your mind. And I think that's very important. Thank you very much for your answers, and thank you very much for, for being with us today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and an honor.